Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Aubrey Reeves, President and CEO of Business and Arts. Before we begin, I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm a white settler speaking to you from Toronto. I have the honor to be a guest on the traditional lands and waters of the Petun and Wendat peoples and the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee confederacies, most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River, as well as many other Indigenous nations, some of whose names are no longer remembered. We acknowledge all who came before us and have traveled the lands and waters of this territory. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live and to meet on this territory. Following a summer with much upsetting news and as we approach the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation this Thursday, many settlers are taking the time to listen, to learn and to reflect on the meaning of reconciliation and what it demands of us. Let this new National Day compel us all to move beyond words of acknowledgement and into actions that will right wrongs to commit to learning the histories of the genocide, displacement, and theft of land from the Indigenous nations, and to continuously decolonize frameworks and roles that were impo imposed upon Indigenous peoples. We're reminded that colonization is not just a part of long ago history, but continues to impact and shape communities. And as such, we all have a choice in how we participate in the treaties of these lands. Today's post-election conversation with global public affairs is a chance for us to unpack last week's election results and to dive deeper into what the impacts are for the cultural sector. I'd like to introduce Global Public Affairs, who have had a long-standing relationship with Business and Arts, as well as with the Canadian Arts Coalition, who is represented today by Sarah Eiley. She will be joining us at, at, to do the wrap-up at the end of the session. So to GPA, first we have Sean Casey, Vice President, Cultural Industries, and Tara Mazurk, Senior Consultant, Cultural Industries. Also joining them is Andrew Walker, Consultant, Cultural Industries, and Abby Tate and Elizabeth Seip, who are both Associate Consultants. Together, they'll be analyzing the election results, identifying power shifts within Parliament, and discussing new and renewed priorities for arts and culture, as well as strategies for building relationships with members of Parliament and immediate opportunities for engagement. The session will also feature an open question and answer period. Only the presenters and moderators will have our microphones on today, so please submit your questions in the Q&A box and vote for the ones you think are most relevant. We're also happy to have ASL interpreters Christy Riyum and Emma DeHayes De from Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service with us here today. Finally, I'd like to thank the Speaker Series presenting partner, Power Corporation of Canada, for your support of this important series, and Manulife Financial, who is our supporting partner. I will now pass the microphone over to Tara. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Our team at Global Public Affairs is calling in from the traditional unceded territory of the Shinabeg Algonquin peoples. And we'd like to take a moment as well to thank Indigenous peoples for learnings about our land, about spirit, and about all our relations. And I don't think we can ignore that today we're talking about a federal election. So we are looking at one very specific framework of gov governance for our communities and for our nation. But I'd like to also acknowledge the many different forms of leadership and support for our communities that exist right across our land. Um, in addition, uh, the where we are calling in from is also known as the Ottawa Gatineau Udue area. So without further ado, we'd like to give you a snapshot of what happened during the election and where we sit now and where we might be going for arts and culture. So our intention is for anyone joining on the call to make sure that you are informed, that you are ready to engage in cultural policy, and you know what opportunities are available for your arts practice and for your organization. Global Public Affairs is Canada's leading government advocacy consultancy, and we are based in Ottawa for the federal level, but we do have offices right across Canada in Toronto, Halifax, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, Victoria, um, as well as different affiliates in different provinces and territories to support where you need it. We are also the only dedicated government relations firm that has a cultural industries practice. And we are very honored to be able to serve this sector and work with many organizations and artists right across the nation. 
Thank you, Tara. I think we've had a, an opportunity to engage with uh, business uh, and the arts and with the Canadian Arts Coalition on a number of occasions, putting together uh, some of these speaker series. Uh, ever since the pandemic started, the first one that we were involved in uh, involved uh, Minister Stephen Debo, where he outlined some of the recovery sector priorities uh, within uh, Canadian heritage and how they were going to support. So I know that uh, I may be a familiar face. I saw a number of familiar names on the participant list who signed up uh, to see what happened just for a week ago and how it's all sorted itself out. Um, as uh, mentioned off the top, uh, we I do have uh, four of my colleagues who are joining me on the call today. Uh, Tara Mazurk, who uh, has just recently been promoted to director at the firm uh, and is a former gallery curator, also a founder of Mass Culture. Uh, Andrew Walker, uh, Abby Tate, and Elizabeth Seip, all newcomers to our team uh, within the past year. Uh, Andrew uh, came to us from uh, Tech Nation, a technology advocacy organization. Uh, he is also the only person on our team that has both a Juno and Grammy nomination under his name. Uh, Abby Tate uh, joined us over the summer. Uh, she also works in our Transportation Infrastructure and Communities Group and with many organizations having infrastructure needs uh, now as the pandemic starts to subside. She's very helpful on that front. Uh, again, comes from a parliamentary background and has been very involved uh, in the with her dance background. And Elizabeth Seip coming over uh, from another government relations firm, again, uh, having worked previously with government relations uh, consulting groups and with clients. Uh, as well from Stratford, so knows the uh, Stratford Festival quite well. Uh, again, we've added all of our uh, social media Twitter accounts. We do uh, try to stay as active as possible on Twitter. Uh, and as we like to say in our business, um, there's no shortage of free beer. So if you're ever looking for free opportunities, we do tweet them out quite regularly in terms of opportunities to engage with the government, reports that are coming, what's coming up at committees, so we try to give an opportunity for people to try to stay engaged and follow us on social media and to have that opportunity to see where they might be able to engage in conversations with the federal government. So who do we work with? Uh, again, it's a broad coalition of organizations. This is just a very, very quick snapshot in terms of who we work with uh, in the sector. As you can see, a wide variety from across the country representing everything from film, television, music, book publishing, performing arts, festivals, museums, all covering a range of for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, all looking to engage on the advocacy front, not only at the federal level, but at the uh, municipal and in some cases, provincial levels as well. So that's a little bit about us. Now what you're here for is to learn what happened just over a week ago. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you to do a snapshot of how things turned out. Thanks, Sean, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so you might have heard there was an election on uh, Monday, or I guess two Mondays ago now. Uh, this is what happened. These are the results as we understand them as of today. The final counts are finally in after the mail-in ballots. And of course, the Liberal Party did win a minority again. Uh, they gained two seats in comparison to the number of seats they had at the end of the last election, so 159. So they fell short of about 11 seats to form the majority. All the same, uh, they form a minority. And you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, the Conservative, NDP, Bloc, and Green Party results. A couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. Let's start with the Green Party. Of course, the Green Party was quite a major factor in the last election, and certainly the environment and climate change has been of note for all politicians over the last while. Uh, the, there's been a significant decline in support for the Green Party in this election, 2.3% of the popular vote, you can see, as compared to 6.5% in 2019. One of the parties you don't see here is the People's Party of Canada, who didn't win a seat, but, but did have a, a strong role to play in this election. In 2019, they had 1.6% of the popular vote, and then this time around, they had a full 5%. And, and that really translated into about 21 seats that we could find across the country in which the results may have been changed if the People's Party and Maxime Bernier had not run. 14 Liberal seats, six New Democrat, and one Bloc Québécois seat. So it's of note all the same that the uh, support for the People's Party did increase. And the final piece I would want to mention just in terms of some of the key things to look at with the results last week. You can see on this map as you see it, you know, you see the red, the blue, the orange, the Bloc. Uh, 
but if you dive into the specific urban centers, there is a divide between what you can see in rural and urban Canada. In this election, the Liberal Party lost six seats that were rural in nature, if we can call them that, to the Conservatives, and a further rural seat to the Bloc Québécois. But the Conservatives lost six urban or suburban seats to the Liberals and two to the New Democrats. So all of that is to say the Liberal Party's base continues to be in places like Toronto, in Montreal, in Halifax, in Vancouver. And the Conservative base seems to be in some of those more rural situations. It'll be interesting to see in future elections what that means for both the Liberals in trying to get the majority, but also for the Conservatives in trying to form government again. Okay, so as you can see from the results that Andrew had just shared, in most regards, Parliament will look largely the same. Um, only about 10% of the seats changed uh, seats, but there, so there will be a lot of familiar faces returning to Parliament. However, that being said, there are definitely some new developments and new records that were set. So uh, with two of the newly elected MPs, having been MPs before this exact election, um, being John Aldeg and Randy Boissano, 50 MPs are first timers or rookie MPs. That's nearly half of the 91 that were sent to Ottawa in 2019, down from a whopping 197 um, from 2015. So that being said, this new cohort is still twice the size of the NDP's entire caucus. So it's all always relative. Um, there's a record 102 women coming to parliament for uh, this year, which is up from 98 in 2019. And many of these women are actually the first women to represent their respective writing. For the first time, three Black women have been elected, and the Ontario riding of Mississauga Streetsville also broke new grounds by electing Liberal Rechie Van Valdez, Canada's very first Filipino-Canadian woman to sit in the House. Throughout this campaign, there were over 60 candidates that identified um, as being from the LGBTQ2S plus community, and a record number of seven won their seats, and this is up from four in 2019. Um, and of these uh, MPs that were successful, one was a woman and one was also Indigenous. A total of 10 Indigenous candidates were elected, which is about the same as 2019. Um, and equally in 2019, there were about 50 MPs that identified as visual minorities, not including Indigenous MPs. And this year, we actually had a net loss of visual minorities, largely due to the seats that were lost by the Conservatives' urban ridings. And the preliminary data shows that we lost about two of those seats to, um, that were visual minorities. So these demographic considerations reflect a slow but steady increase of participation from communities and populations that have largely been absent from parliamentary spaces, but also potentially a, a sentiment that reflects, you know, a want to have a parliament that is truly reflective of Canada's population. So obviously there is still much more to do, um, but as more faces and voices from these marginalized communities are elected, we expect to see legislative agendas really kind of reflect these shifts in demographics. Um, I'll now pass it to Elizabeth um, on some of the dynamics of a minority parliament. So looking at this chart here, we can see which parties the Liberals are going to have to work with in order to reach that one really important 170 seat number in order to pass legislation through the House. The Liberals will most likely have to look for support from the NDP or Bloc, because with support from these parties, they will, need, will have to be able to pass legislation. If they have support from the Bloc, they will reach 192 seats, 184 seats with the NDP, and they will reach 270 seats if both parties support them. What this means is that we will most likely see an integration of Bloc and NDP, NDP platform promises and both the speech from the throne and the 2022 budget. Another way to look at this chart as well is how opposition could bring down parliament in a non-confidence vote. Currently, if parliament were to fall due to a non-confidence vote, this would mean that the conservatives, NDP, and the bloc would have to work together with the total being 177 seats. So of course we need support from the other parties to move forward on key issues, but the Liberals as a governing minority government have made a number of commitments, both in the previous parliamentary session and in their platform. Um, and we're going to go through some of uh, what matters to the arts and culture sector. And Erin had just shared the Liberal platform document in the chat. So if you do want to read that after the webinar on your own time, there are a lot of really great insights in reading a document like that. 
the first thing as we've been through the pandemic um, is are the relief and recovery supports. So you're thinking the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, the Canada Recovery Benefit for, for individuals, among others. Now, the government from the previous session does have the power to extend the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy until November. However, we're seeing across parties that they want a wind down of relief supports and instead incentivize a return to work. So they are looking to extend the Canada Recovery Hiring Program until March 31st, 2022. And this will be to hire um, new people or to increase worker hours. And it is currently available now as well. And they are thinking about creating a transitional support system for out of work cultural workers. So you are seeing a, a shift from those immediate relief supports onto recovery reopening. With that said, being in a pandemic, we do not know how it is going to play out. Um, and if the pandemic, let's cross our fingers, not if it does happen to worsen over the coming months, there may be advocacy efforts underway to continue some of those relief supports. But otherwise, as we all want to reopen, we are looking to get back to, to work through the hiring program and the transitional support for out of work cultural workers. In addition, there was 400 million announced in budget 2021 from last spring that has yet to be rolled out through key programs at Canadian Heritage. So we are expecting once the government gets back up and running over the next couple months that we'll have a little bit more clarity on how that 400 million is to be spent. As well, um, we are going to be having a new arts and culture recovery fund for ticket matching to compensate organizations for reduced capacity. One important note on the ticket matching is that it could take some time for this to be implemented. However, they're thinking that it could be backdated. So Global will be monitoring for any updates on this fund and we'll send out announcements once more information is available. Additionally, uh, the government is a priority for the government is extending insurance coverage for media production. As well, in the platform, in their platform, the Liberals indicated that they want to hold a summit on the arts and culture industry within the first 100 days. At the end of the last session, the Broadcasting Act Bill C-10 was particularly relevant, was a tool being used by all the political parties for their own ends, but of course. The Liberal Party has promised to reintroduce legislation to amend the Broadcasting Act to their platform. We expect to hear about that before the new year, and that legislation will likely be very similar to the Broadcasting Act Bill C-10 that was previously introduced, but with, with some amendments, as we understand, there were going to be more amendments to come even when it was at the Senate stage in the previous iteration. Uh, beyond that, uh, the government has also promised within the first 100 days, again, before the end of this calendar year, to introduce uh, a leveling the playing field sort of bill for news media and digital platforms. If you think about when you read a news article or snippets of a news article on Facebook or on Google, the government wants to ensure that some of those large organizations are quote unquote paying their fair share into the news media ecosystem. Very similar projects have been undertaken in places like Australia. And I know that this government is hoping to base our the Canadian model off of that one. All the same, it'll be very interesting to see what is included in this legislation. It'll be introduced, as I say, within the first 100 days, and then how that is taken by both folks in the cultural sector and beyond. All the same, that'll be certainly a priority for the government in the first 100 days. And to add on to that, there's, there's a situation here. Uh, Minister Guibault, prior to the election, had four priority bills, broadcasting being one, uh, the digital platform with relation to news content being the second, a bill that was introduced just prior to the House being dissolved for the election on hate speech. And the, the number four priority issue was the amendments to the Copyright Act. Remember back to 2019, or prior to 2019, there were two studies done uh, in the Heritage Committee and in the Industry Committees that looked at issues related to copyright in relation to the uh, mandated five-year review when the previous legislation was passed in 2012. The one addition that the Liberals have added to this uh, promise is the fact that they will include a resale right for artists, which many visual artists have been calling for for many years. But that doesn't mean that will be the only thing that they will be moving forward on. Uh, if you remember, uh, almost a year ago, uh, the Canada-US-Mexico Free Trade Agreement was signed 
It does have copyright related components that need to be passed within the next six to 12 months. So there is an impetus to move on amendments to the Copyright Act, which would include a wide variety of measures, uh, everything relating to uh, changes to uh, broadcasting uh, and radio requirements, uh, to changes to fair dealing for the educational uh, publishing sectors, and everything in between. There will be opportunities for those measures to be put forward. Uh, another commitment they made, and this is uh, an echoing of a commitment that, that the Liberals made back in 2015, where there were strong investments made in CBC and Radio Canada in their first mandate. They have uh, earmarked an additional 400 million over four years for the public broadcaster to uh, provide additional service. And also they will be doing a full scale review of their mandate as part of this. Uh, next and then finally, in terms of general sort of big policy areas, the Official Languages Act was a bill that was introduced, or the modernization of the Official Languages Act, I should say, was a bill that was introduced in the last uh, Parliament, Bill C-32. The government has promised to reintroduce or to introduce a reformed act in the first 100 days, again, before the new year. Uh, this act would have some effect on the Supreme Court, for example, making sure that justices are bilingual, give more powers to the Commissioner of Official Languages. But what's particularly relevant for the arts and culture sector as part of this bill and others is the support for official language minority communities. That's English speaking folks in Quebec, for example, French speaking folks in the rest of Canada, for example, and others. This bill and the promises of the government would ensure that community spaces would be available for those groups. Other program, including art, would be supported even further than it already is for those groups. So, we expect to find out more information about what that bill looks like within the first 100 days. In addition, uh, beyond strictly cultural policy, a lot of people are asking about employment insurance or the idea of a universal basic income, which has been a bit of a conversation in the arts for some time. Now, all parties have committed to modernizing employment insurance in some way. Um, and they're kind of referring to work with an existing system to support self-employed workers and gig economy workers. And the Liberals have committed specifically that self-employed workers would pay in to a modernized employment insurance system and be able to get the benefits from it. So currently they are hosting consultations until October 8th. And then over the course of the fall and into next year, they'll be looking at that feedback and creating a program design, hopefully for launch later next year for accessing the employment insurance system. Now, the NDP and the Green are the only parties in their platform that had committed to something that almost looked like basic income, but not quite. The NDPs were looking at a minimum of $2,000 a month, similar to the Canada Recovery Benefit and CERB, and the Green Party did actually call their, um, their idea the guaranteed basic income. So there is, there is conversation around that, but looking at employment insurance as the first mechanism for, for access and opening up income support. Okay, and then some of the ongoing programs that will carry over from the last parliament and budget 2021 are outlined here on the table, but um, Telephone Canada has been given a 50 million permanent increase. The government will double its contribution to the Canada Media Fund over three years. It will also provide 50 million to the Canada Music Fund by 2024 slash 25. The Indigenous Screening Office will get 13 million per year. To support Canadian authors and publishers, the government has committed 43 million per year, an increase of 50% through a few different channels. And finally, the government has committed 20 million per year to the cultural diplomacy strategy. I'll now open it to my colleagues just to provide any further insight or color to, to some of these programs. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, I will note for the Canadian authors and publishers, uh, those channels are the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Council for the Arts and Public Lending Right. And for the cultural diplomacy strategy, there already is a creative export strategy, but it is more focused on trade, export revenue, you have a product that's ready to go to international markets. Cultural diplomacy is much broader than that. It allows for collaboration, relationship building, uh, professional development and artistic development exchanges. So we're very curious to see how that 20 million 
uh, per year will be spent. Um, I know that one of the priorities is to make sure the embassies abroad are staffed with cultural support and that their staff is trained and know the arts cult know the art sector, know its dynamics, and are able to make those networked connections internationally. And, and the one piece I might add just on this chart here that Abby outlined is kind of, you know, when can you see the money, if you will, if I'm going to quote from, uh, from uh, not Tom Cruise, but uh, anyways, uh, if, uh, when, when will you folks actually see the money? Uh, some of the commitments that were in the Liberal platform, of course, were commitments that were in Budget 2021. Uh, but many of the new commitments that you might see here are likely to be included in the fall economic statement, which would come probably in late November, or perhaps and quite likely into budget 2022 and beyond. So these are these are promises that were in the Liberal platform as they currently stand. Of course, they rely on, and some of these include uh, commitments that were made in budget 2021, but some more specifics on how you'll be able to access these many millions of dollars that you see on the screen will be uh, will become evident in due course. So next we're going to be looking sort of more at a, a visual table to see what the different parties platform commitments are. So you can see here that uh, there's two sort of major areas where, where all parties agree. So this uh, is making sure that web giants uh, pay their fair share, as well as modernizing um, employment insurance. So one thing that I think it's also important to note um, in regards to uh, amending the Broadcasting Act is that each party sort of wants to do it um, in their own way. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how, um, with uh, the government being a minority government for the Liberals, how we can sort of see these different platform commitments from the different parties being um, uh, amended into, uh, into important government mandates coming forward. So next, um, we're going to be looking at sort of how the NDP and the Bloc Québécois are sort of hold this really interesting balance of power right now within the House. So they hold a lot of influence uh, currently because the Liberals cannot pass legislation without one of the party support. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, this means that party platform promises from both of the parties will most likely be integrated into uh, the upcoming government mandate. So for the arts and culture sector, this means that there is the possibility um, of the following being implemented that you can see on, uh, on the, the screen here. So this includes funding for Indigenous theater at the National Arts Center, um, modernizing the Broadcasting Act, sort of um, influence of official languages um, in the arts and culture sector as well. So who is back? Well, the previous ministers of Canadian heritage, not on this list, but Minister Kipo, Minister Jolie, and Minister Rodriguez, they are all re-elected. But here are some of the faces that you may not know. Um, Julie DeBrusen, Andy Fillmore, Arif Barani, Ra Randy Boissonneau, all previous parliamentary secretaries to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. So these were the people who are kind of the, the second in charge at the political level for Canadian heritage. So a lot of great support in those four individuals. In addition, uh, Marcy Ian, who was elected in Toronto Centre during the last parliament, a uh, former broadcaster, has experience in film and television, very supportive of arts and culture, along with Julie Zerowitz in Toronto Davenport, who has a very high concentration of creative organizations and artists in her riding. Um, she also previously sat on the Heritage Committee and is very uh, supportive of arts and culture issues. Heather McPherson and Alexandre Fouleris uh, from the NDP also sat on the Heritage Committee with Alexandre Fouleris being the crit NDP critic for heritage, meaning that for the NDP, he was the person in charge of holding the government to accountable on key cultural issues. And from the Conservatives, you have Martin Shields, Alan Reyes, who both also sat on the Heritage Committee with Alan Reyes being the heritage critic and Martin Shampoo and Carolyn Debien from the Bloc. Uh, Martin Shampoo had sat on the Heritage uh, Committee as the critic for communications, while Carolyn Debien, who did not sit on the Heritage Committee, but was the critic for arts and culture. So these are a few faces that we hope to see again, speaking up on arts and culture issues. 
In addition, the other side of, of Parliament, which is the Senate, there is a small group of senators that have a arts and culture caucus, and they have committed to bringing up arts and culture issues in the Senate. Um, if you follow Patricia Bovey at all in some of her speeches, she's very vocal in sharing um, stories around arts organizations, what's going on, making sure they're on the radar in the Senate and connecting it with different priorities, not just focused on the arts, but how it links to social, um, social development and communities, how it links with health, how it links with education. Renée Cormier and Paula Simons, who also have a background in arts and culture, work very closely with Patricia um, as a group of three to advance arts and culture issues. Well, Jose Forrest Missing and Dennis Dawson, um, they have a background in arts and culture to an extent, with Jose Forrest Missing um, sitting on the board of the Ontario Arts Council. And Dennis Dawson, he's the previous chair of the Communications Committee in the Senate, really advancing some of the conversations around broadcasting. And just as a quick note before I turn to the next slide, Dennis Dawson was also the lead for the broadcasting bill in the Senate in the last iteration of the bill. So we'll have to wait and see if he plays that role again, but all the same, he certainly will have a role to play of some sort. Uh, as we turn now to the new faces this time around, I know we alluded to the fact that many folks uh, were reelected or that the results didn't change a tremendous amount, but indeed there are many new faces worthy of note for our sector. And I'll run through them quite quickly with some, I guess, some fun facts about them that are relevant to you folks. Uh, Pas Pascal Saint-Ange on the left-hand side, she was elected in Brumissisquoi in Quebec. Uh, she's the former president of the Fédération Nationale des Communications de la Culture. She has a long history with broadcasting, copyright, new print media issues, and certainly had a strong role to play in, in the support for print media recently. Uh, she's also a bass player and a vocalist for a Montreal band called Mad June, so check them out. Uh, but she appeared quite regularly with Minister Gilbeau throughout the election. Uh, so we expect to hear more from Pascal Saint-Ange. Leila Goodridge for the Conservatives was elected in Fort McMurray, uh, Cold Lake in Alberta. Uh, Leila was the a member of the Legislative Assembly, was a member of the Legislative Assembly and the Parliamentary Secretary for the Francophonie uh, in, in her previous role. She also worked for a former Minister of Canadian Heritage in Ottawa as a political staffer. Michelle Ferreri was elected in Peterborough, Kawartha. She uh, won against Mary Monset, who you re may remember was the Minister of Gender Equality. Um, Michelle Ferrari is a TV host and anchor uh, for Chorus Entertainment, very big in the Peterborough region. And uh, she's a self-employed content creator and digital storyteller. So certainly someone that understands the modern day of, of what it means to create content in the art and culture world. Uh, René Villemur is uh, from Trois-Rivières in Quebec. Uh, he is the academic of the bunch here. He's an author and lecturer in business, health, education, international relations, and culture. I mean, I, I could list almost everything, and he seems to be an expert in it, uh, but certainly has a PhD in philosophy and a specialist in language. Uh, Talib Nur Mohammed was elected in Vancouver Granville, which was Jody Wilson Raybould's writing, if you remember her name from a few years ago. Uh, he served on the Vancouver 2010 Olympics organizing committee, so has a strong history in sports, certainly. He was also the VP of a company called Home Away, which turned out to be Expedia, which you might be able to book a trip to very soon. Um, Dominique Vien was from Belchasse Les Echemins des Vies in Quebec. She's a journalist for Radio Canada and Passion FM Radio. Uh, Reggie Valdez, Abby already referred to Reggie. She's the first Filipina Canadian member of parliament ever. Uh, she's from Mississauga Streetsville in Ontario, has quite a history with basketball, with sport, uh, music, comedy. She's produced and hosted a TV show called Fearlessly Creative. And I'm certainly excited to find a clip of her on The Big Bank, which was a Food Network Canada show. So I'll be very curious to find that uh, in my spare time. Uh, Leslyn Lewis from Haldeman Norfolk in Ontario as well, former leadership contender for the Conservative Party. You might remember her as running against Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole, who ended up winning. Uh, she has a PhD in law and a concentration in business and the environment and quite recently sat on the board of the Ontario Trillium Foundation and was also on the board committee responsible for youth programs. So, so someone certainly with that background. Uh, Melissa Lansman, a rising star in the Conservative Party in Thorn, Thornhill, Ontario. Uh, she sat on the board of Hot Docs Film Festival. Uh, she has also been a host and contributor to News Talk 1010 Radio in and around Toronto, and of course the CBC. Uh, Ryan Williams from Bay of Quinte, Ontario. He was the president of Williams Hotels uh, in the Belleville region in Ontario. 
Best Western Marriott, a whole bunch of them. Uh, so he certainly has a focus both as a city councilor and as a businessman in tourism and hospitality. Uh, Valerie Bradford, another academic, I guess, in a sense, certainly she has a, an academic history in travel and tourism, having studied it at Humber. She was elected in Kitchener to Hespler in Ontario. And finally, last but not least, we have Lena Diab, who was a minister for many sort of, uh, sort of things in Nova Scotia. She's now elected as the member of parliament for Halifax West. Most recently, she was attorney general in Nova Scotia, but she also served as a minister of Acadian affairs and the Francophony uh, in Nova Scotia for a period of time. She's also the only female member of parliament uh, for the Liberal Party in Nova Scotia. And that's particularly interesting as Sean will speak about in just a moment. Well, thank you, Andrew. And I see already in the Q&A box, we're getting questions about who's going to be the new minister. And uh, we'll have a little bit of speculation at the end of this slide. But uh, again, building a new cabinet is not easy, even though everyone has said the election results really didn't change things much. We are in a situation where uh, the numbers uh, in terms of where things have landed for ministers do make for some difficult choices for the prime minister. We are in a situation where uh, in 2015, when the Liberals won a majority government, uh, they downsized the cabinet from where Stephen Harper had it to only 30 ministers. 2019, the Liberals won a minority government and they increased the number of ministers up to 37. As I alluded to in 2021, uh, four ministers uh, are, are no longer in cabinet. Three of them were defeated in the election, one in Nova Scotia, as uh, Andrew alluded to, there being a vacancy in that province, two in Ontario, and a third, Catherine McKenna, the infrastructure minister, decided not to run in this election. So um, the easy answer for a prime minister that wants to have a gender balanced cabinet, you would say, well, a point for female ministers that are MPs, and there you go, easy peasy, you have yourself a gender balanced cabinet. Here's the problem. Uh, the Liberals for the first time in two elections won seats in the province of Alberta. Randy Boissonneau won in Edmonton, and they also had a candidate who won in Calgary. The expectation is that those two members will go into cabinet, uh, and that would make the balance even worse. There would actually be six more male members than they have female ministers. So we get into a situation as to there are a couple of options available to the prime minister that he can try to, to move forward on. The first one would be very simply expand the size of his cabinet, add four cabinet seats, uh, and you would end up having a cabinet that would be gender balanced and would allow for the addition of all the new ministers that would be needed to provide that balance. The problem you face is you look at that number uh, of 37, which he was at at 2019, and that's what he finished with when he went into this election, that would bring the number of ministers to 41. Why that is important is 40 ministers is the most ministers we have ever had in Canadian history. Stephen Harper and his majority government had 40 ministers, and Brian Mulroney back in the 1980s, uh, when he won 75% of the seats in the House, had a three member cabinet. So again, on the heels of a $650 million election that a lot of people said didn't change the landscape all that much, as adding hundreds of millions of dollars in new cabinet seats might not be the best optics for the prime minister. Door number two is much more difficult. And again, this is not to say, I think we've had one of the strongest ministers in Stephen Yvo we've had in some time. Again, ensuring that priority items related to the pandemic receive funding for the arts and culture sector, he has not really put a step wrong in terms of that portfolio. But when you're trying to shift a, a balance and trying to potentially keep the number of cabinet ministers at a reasonable number at 37, you may have to have the unenviable task of replacing male ministers with female ministers. If you do that, you'd have to move at least two of them and you would go to areas where you have the greatest number of MPs. That would be Toronto, where the Liberals hold every single seat in the 416 area code, and in Montreal, where they hold every single seat with the exception of Alexandre Maurice from the NDP. Uh, in Montreal, where Stephen Guibault is a cabinet minister, right now there are five male ministers and one female minister, Melanie Jolly. So you get into a numbers game in terms of who might potentially get moved in that group. And again, you also look at the individual 
and the cabinet portfolio. So your choices, uh, the difficult ones for the prime minister, is he would have to choose which of the following Montreal cabinet ministers would not be in their place from Mark Garneau, your Minister of Foreign Affairs, David Lametti, your Minister of Justice, Mark Miller, your Minister of Indigenous Services, Pablo Rodriguez, the former Heritage Minister and now the Government House Leader, a critically important role in the, uh, in the House of Commons in a minority parliament, or Stephen Guibault in Canadian Heritage. Another fact to keep in mind if you look at history, the last seven Canadian heritage ministers have been rookies in the portfolio. We have not had a repeat cabinet minister in Canadian heritage since the 1980s and Sheila Cox. So if we can go back through the Trudeau government, the Harper government, and back into the Cretchen government. That's how far back we've had since we haven't had somebody who's a rookie in this position. Trying to keep that gender balance and regional balance is a challenge. And in terms of minister speculation, they are looking to try to bring the house back um, in, and, you know, in terms of overall work, I think Stephen Guibault um, has done an exceptionally good job, but there may be a situation here where the numbers don't work against some strong cabinet ministers and we might see some new names anywhere from a Pascal Saint-Ange, as was mentioned previously, to a Rachel ben -Danian. Uh, again, there's some talk of somebody like a Randy Boissonneau, who has been a previous parliamentary secretary in Canadian heritage, if he ends up in cabinet. Again, there are some challenges here going through that he is going to have to ensure that he has both a gender diverse and a regionally diverse uh, cabinet. And we also have to remember that the Liberals, since taking the power in 2015, and even back into the Cretchen years, have not had a heritage minister from outside Quebec since Sheila Cox. So that's always factors into the equation. Okay, thanks, John. So now that we have a pretty full picture of the next parliament, we can turn to what we expect in the coming days and weeks. So despite the election being just over a week ago, um, some MPs have already begun returning to the Hill to get their offices back up and running, and new MPs have begun their onboarding process. So while the election results really do show a clear message from Canadians. We just want you to get back to work. Um, because the Liberals were re-elected, they'll likely get uh, back up and running pretty quickly. So first, the Prime Minister's office will be working on determining the members of Cabinet, as Sean alluded to. This work is already underway. And Trudeau today has announced that he will announce his Cabinet in October. And we expect likely around Thanksgiving, kind of give or take a week. And mandate letters will be drawn up by the Prime Minister's office in conjunction with the Privy Council office. Um, ministers will get these letters immediately after being uh, chosen to be in cabinet, but they will likely not be published to the public and available to the public until seven to 10 days after that. Uh, based on these cabinet appointments, the prime minister will then select who will sit on the various cabinet committees um, that they run. Um, each of the ministers will begin getting up to speed on their new portfolio if they are shuffled. And at the same time, opposition parties will begin to select their critics. Um, and announce their shadow cabinet. So as of now, we are hearing that the House is expected to return October 18th or around there. Um, and this begins with the election um, of the Speaker of the House. Um, once that person is in place, the government can proceed with their speech from the throne. And in with regards to that, the Liberals will have to work with opposition parties, as Elizabeth alluded to, to proceed with that speech from the throne and get it to pass. So you may see some negotiation on either side of, uh, of the house to, to pass that uh, speech. And finally, the leaders will begin determining which members will sit on the various house standing committees. These are permanent committees that sit in every parliament. Um, so they are kind of special committees. So with all of these timelines in mind, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and it's important at first not to panic as a lot of these things still take time, uh, even though it's relatively, relatively quick. So ministers, again, need time to get up to speed and familiar with a brand new portfolio, potentially, and 50 new MPs need to learn their role. Um, and in the early days, it really is a matter of priorities, with the first being just grasping their role, the second being learning um, the ropes, and then it will be listening to and acting on the issues that you all care about. Um, so that being said, there are ample opportunities to advocate and engage 
uh, with this new parliament. Um, and I can turn to my colleagues now who will discuss how you can do that. Well, this is the opportunity to, again, when we go into a new parliament, uh, raise the profile of the organizations that you work with. There are always important issues that everyone is trying to work forward on. And again, uh, as an organization, we have worked with a significant number of organizations in the arts and culture sector and have built everything from traditional government relations services, which are your standard monthly retainer type services, uh, working, trying to ensure that you raise your profile of your issues in your organization. One of the other areas, which is always important for the not-for-profit sector, is trying to build coalitions. And we have had a number of coalitions over the years that we've been able to build based on various issues of importance, where a number of organizations from across the country have a common goal in terms of something that they want to achieve, and building those commonalities uh, across, whether it be linguistic lines, regional lines, uh, uh, departmental or sector lines, is really valuable in terms of having both the department and the political staff and ministers understand what the issues are that are a common thread and how they're supported by a wide variety of regions. Of course, we're in a situation right now where the pandemic supports are going to start to wind down. But as you can see from the government commitments, they are moving forward with significant investments and many of them are starting to make permanent. We have about a two to three year window as a sector and uh, Tara will talk a little bit about the work that we've done in the past with the Canadian Arts Coalition, with Arts Day on the Hill, trying to amplify some of those messages and try to make those opportunities top of mind for those government decision makers that are moving the needle on and where the government is going. I should also say the door is always open for anyone who is on this call to reach out to any of us and we will put our contact information at the end uh, to just ask questions. Again, we're more than happy to give free advice and, and give some type of direction as to how you can best amplify your own messages here in Ottawa and within provincial jurisdictions. Tara, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about advocacy training as well. John, um, before I, I dive into advocacy training, I, I do want to touch on what you just mentioned around the Canadian Arts Coalition. I believe you will all hear from Sarah a little bit later, but they put a really great web page together on all of the different platform commitments from the election from all parties during the election. So um, Aaron, I, I believe you'll, you'll throw that link in the chat as well. Um, Arts Day on the Hill is a great opportunity to engage once that is back up and running post pandemic. But we also work with some smaller coalitions on issue specific areas. So, you know, if you don't want to go in and advocate for an issue alone, there are always other organizations that are likely facing the same issue. Um, and you could come to us with a couple of those organizations, you could come to us alone and say, I have this issue, what do I do with it? And we can hopefully help uh, you bridge some of those connections and advise on next steps. I mean, the very fact that you are all here listening to this webinar shows that you have an interest in what is going on in the government and what opportunities might be available for the health of your organization and for the sector. And we're here to serve the sector. We're here to make sure that you are empowered and you are informed to engage with the government in a way that makes sense for you. So we are packaging our 10 plus years of government relations experience into an online home study advocacy training course that will be available coming spring 2022. And uh, notre programme de formation, comme plaidoyer, va être offert en français aussi. So it will be bilingual. And Erin did put a link in the chat box to a newsletter that will give you monthly advocacy tips and uh, information about the launch of that program for spring. So if you want to just build up your skills, get a little bit more information on what makes sense for your organization, that is the place to go. In addition, if you're ready to get started right now and you have an issue or you need funding um, and you want to know what's going on, we are here to help on an ongoing or project basis immediately. And we certainly make sure that we consider your capacity. How big is your staff? What do you already know about advocacy? How are we an extension of your team that can not only advise, but maybe do some of the heavy lifting as well? And we also consider your budget. So we are committed to working with nonprofits, charities, for-profit companies of all sizes 
Um, and it, we do endeavor to, to find a model that is going to work for you. We'd also be remiss without referring to the regional questions or the provincial government questions that often come up, uh, especially with regards to capacity restrictions over the last, however long it's been now, two years, vaccine passports or whatever your jurisdiction is calling them these days. Certainly those are areas of extreme importance for arts organizations like yourselves. And there are elections coming too in places like Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta, and Montreal, and Toronto, the list goes on. And so as global public affairs, we certainly can offer support on those levels as well. We've spoken about the federal government today, but we have offices, as Tara mentioned off the top, across the country in BC and Alberta, Toronto. We have regional supports uh, in other provinces and out east as well. Uh, and the last point to make here is on language. We talked a little bit about some of the language priorities for the government, but certainly arts and culture has been a major focus in this election and for a very long time in Quebec and in French Canada, as well as the rest of the country. Uh, Global Public Affairs is happy to offer our services in both English and in French for arts clients. And certainly we know that engaging with the government in this minority context, it'll be important to engage with folks from the Bloc Québécois right through the rest of the country as well. So with that, uh, we're just about to dive into question and answer. I've noticed a few questions have been coming into the Q&A. Now is the time to put your questions there if you have some. Uh, on the screen, you will see our emails and our Twitter handles. Please do message us if you need any support in any way. And we'll also make sure those emails are in the chat box once we, once we close off the presentation. So with uh, that, Monica, over to you for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Tara, Sean, Andrew, Elizabeth, and Abby. That was really illuminating. I think um, since you finished off with advocacy uh, stuff, I, I might ask, um, a lot of people perceive advocacy to take a lot of time. And for many smaller organizations, they don't necessarily know where to begin. What are one or two quick, easy things you would recommend that everybody listening right now do in the next couple of weeks with the new parliament in place just to build relationships? Uh, if I could take this one, it is to find out who your elected MP is. Are they re-elected or are they new? And so on elections.ca, you can search the postal code, not only of where you live, but the writing of your organization, the postal code of your organization as well. And the first thing you can do is just send a congrats letter with an offer to meet. The first step is always relationship building and making sure to build that familiarity early on. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes into advocacy, and this is why we do this full time. But at the same time, if the only thing that you do is send a congrats letter to your MP and start to build that relationship, that'll open doors and avenues and opportunities that you may not have known of before. And I think the only other thing I would add from my perspective is you know, I agree with Tara's comments about sending that congratulatory letter, especially if you're constituent of the MP's writing, invite them to your place of work, invite them to your productions, invite them to see and walk a mile in your shoes. It's amazing how that, especially coming out of COVID, if you can have a safe personal connection, they will remember that and you, you, it's a unique opportunity. No disrespect to those factories that make widgets, but arts and culture is a little bit more entertaining, exciting for them to, to experience and see firsthand. Yeah. Great. So you touched on it briefly, and I see there's also people asking about it. Um, the wage and rent subsidies are winding down, and it does sound, as you said, that these programs are not going to get an, a major extension. But you mentioned that there's plans in the works for some sort of transitional support for arts and culture sector. Do we know if that transitional support will be ready as soon as the wage subsidies end? And what kind of shape or format will this program take? How will it differ from the wage subsidy? So maybe I can launch into that to start and, and the team can add on from there. Uh, the program that is in place that I think Tara spoke to a little bit earlier is the Recovery Hiring Program, CRHP. That certainly is the program that the Government of Canada, the Liberal Party points to when we talk about the end of the wage subsidy. The idea being that it would help provide some of the funds necessary to hire folks back into organizations. So you think about, you know, if you're hiring folks back to run concession stands or as ushers or whatever else in your theater, for example, uh, that would be the type of program the government is encouraging organizations to take advantage of. Uh, it's also worth noting, as we've talked about here, the number of specific uh, programs that the government refers to, to you know, areas of the cultural industries and arts sector. 
be it books or be it music or whatever else. I think the government is still uh, also prioritizing some of the sectors that are the most hardest hit uh, in terms of that extended support that was in budget 2021 and that they promised to continue. Some of that funding will become more clear now that the election has happened. We'll have new ministers in place to be able to approve some of those grants that you might have applied for. We can also expect to find out more about what the commitments to the platform will actually look like in terms of policy through things like the fall economic statement, which will likely be in the latter half of November, budget 2022 and beyond. So we certainly will have more to report, but that backlog of programs that has been in place since the last budget, we expect to start moving forward as a result of the new, the, the new cabinet being put in place. Thanks. Andrew, and to, to add to that, I think the fall economic statement and the budget in the spring, just to reiterate those timelines, are, are very key milestones in the government where you may see a nod to what support might be to come. When the Canada Recovery Benefit winds down, should it not be renewed, we have to think about which avenues individuals can get support. So if not through direct hiring and wage support from organizations, we know that individuals can't really access Canadian heritage funding, but they can access Canada Council funding. So what might be the role of the Canada Council through the recovery period? In addition, that modernization of employment insurance, um, or if they do make uh, sector specific tweaks to the Canada Recovery Benefit, but that is a global program available to all citizens. So it may be harder to justify doing that other than putting it through avenues that are already available like EI or like the Canada Council. Great. So um, we're going to go over a little bit um, in for to get to questions, but I just reminded all of our panelists to just slow down a little bit for our um, ASL interpreters. So now I'm going to ask Monica to join us, who's going to um, pull up some of the questions from our audience. Hi, thanks so much. And just quickly before we get to questions, um, Business and Arts are looking for new team members currently. So if you'd like to be a part of producing dynamic programming, such as the Speaker Series, Canadian Arts Summit, and Awards Celebration, please visit the Business and Arts website, which is businessandarts.org forward slash careers to see our available openings. And I'll post the link in chat as well. Um, our first question will be, uh, sorry, just pulling up the Q&A. Our first question comes from Jason Samilski, who says, are you aware of any plans for those receiving CRB and unable to return to work and for those who continue to need that support beyond the end of the program? So I, th I think, Monica, if that was covered in our, our previous question around looking at the fall economic statement and looking at budget 2022 in the spring to understand where the government is going and seeing where individual funding might come from. So through organizations to new hires or through Canada Council for the Arts to individual artists or through the employment insurance program. Perfect, thanks so much. Our second question is uh, wondering if you have any details on what the ticket matching funds might look like. So I can speak to this a little bit uh, and just say that, uh, of course, this was a promise made uh, by the Liberal Party in, in its platform. So the details to the extent that we have them or what are in the platform, which you'll be able to see in the chat, I think earlier. So uh, for the specifics is what they are, you can find them there. Uh, we know that it is based on a similar program in Quebec. The intention of the program in Quebec was to match the number of tickets your organization was able to sell, but taking into account the capacity restriction that may be in place. So let's just say for sake of argument, the capacity restriction is that you can only have 50% of the capacity of your building being sold. And let's say for sake of argument, your organization was able to sell 40% of the seats available. So almost all of them the government would match that 40% number as if you had sold the same percentage, but without capacity restrictions. That's the, the, the idea of the model in terms of what the specifics are, when it'll come into place, what price the ticket they're assuming it's going to be, all those sorts of things. The details are definitely still to come, but that's the model that the program is based off of. 
We can also say that we've heard uh, some of the government bureaucrats have started work on this program already. I mean, we, and I think as Abby or perhaps Elizabeth alluded to earlier, uh, we do expect it to be backdated, but of course, this is all still in negotiation phase. This is all st a part of a process to come. Uh, but the earliest time that would be natural for the government to introduce this program into legislation would be as we referred to the fall economic statement, the latter half of November, or perhaps into next year's budget. So we'll keep uh, we'll keep you posted for sure as we know more about what that program will look like. But those are some general ideas as, as at this point. Monica, I, I don't think we can hear you. Sorry, it would help if I unmuted my microphone as well as in Zoom. Uh, so our next question is asking if you'd be able to speak a little more about the comment on a transitionary program for cultural workers that are out of work currently. Thank you, Monica. I think I think we're getting a few questions around the cultural workers income support and just reiterating some of the earlier comments about the to look at the fall economic statement budget 2021 check individual support through Canada Council for the Arts and um, see to participate participate in the employment insurance modernization as well and monitor some of those conversations. Thank you. Our next question is asking if you have any word on legisla legislation limiting liability for organizations who mandate vaccines. I, I think uh, one of the challenges with uh, a lot of the legislation around vaccines uh, and the vaccine mandates is quite a, quite a few of them are provincial in scope. Uh, and it, it varies by province. So the, the, unfortunately, I don't know the, the question or which area of the country they happen to be in. Um, so I, I unfortunately, I don't think uh, there is any plans right at the moment to have a federally uh, mandated program or put that in place. It would be up to, as the same with uh, capacity restrictions, vaccine requirements are all done at the provincial level. And just to add, I would, that would be... That's a really great question where we would lean on our amazing regional offices across Canada where they join our calls and, and those kinds of things to provide some of the nuance um, to, to a concern like that. Yeah, for uh, anyone who's curious about that, please, I think our if you scroll up in the chat, our emails are available. We would be happy to connect you with some of our regional colleagues. The last point perhaps worth making on that one is to say that the government of Canada did commit or the Liberal Party did commit to ensuring that all folks who board uh, air, uh, trains, planes and automobiles, if you will, uh, uh, not quite automobiles, um, to be fully vaccinated. Uh, so we'll be looking into that legislation. It's not a direct answer to the question that was asked in terms of liability. Uh, but all the same, uh, we may learn some more about the government of Canada's intentions and its interaction with the provincial governments uh, on that file through that legislation as it comes. I don't have any indication, I don't know if my colleagues do, on when we should expect that, exactly what form it will take. But all the same, that would be the only other sort of policy piece that I would encourage folks to track to be helpful on that front in terms of the federal government. Thank you so much. Our next question is... They're wondering and curious to know more about the cultural diplomacy policy plans. And they'd like to know if you know if the government intends to share much information widely about these. That is a wonderful question. Cultural diplomacy is one of the issues that um, I really hope we see more on. And we've been monitoring it for a few years now and haven't seen much traction partly in because there's been a bit of a shift in uh, the ministers in foreign affairs um, and making cultural diplomacy a priority after NAFTA and now the pandemic. So there already is a creative export strategy through Canadian Heritage, as I mentioned, which focuses on international trade, products and export revenue. But cultural diplomacy is going to facilitate more events collaborations, professional development and artistic exchanges. And we know that the staff in foreign affairs is very committed to making sure that their staff in each of the, the Canadian embassies abroad 
know about arts and culture and know who is available. They've also been sharing digital content with their embassies abroad throughout the pandemic. So I think for those who are interested in cultural diplomacy, to be able to reach out to the staff of foreign affairs and start building that network because they can really help make those connections. Whether or not we're going to see direct funding for cultural diplomacy is still a big question mark. We know that the Canada Council provides travel funds. Not sure if foreign affairs may fill some of the, the gaps there, but this is something that we're very eagerly monitoring uh, over the coming, coming months to see where it goes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, can MPs accept tickets? The Commissioner of Lobbying Rules have not recommended this unless they are appearing or speaking in their role as an MP. Example, inviting an MP from your city who is an arts champion, but not necessarily the MP for the riding where your performance venue is. Uh, again, the, the guidance, uh, obviously you've looked at the guidance from the Commissioner of Lobbying, and I'd like to say it's about as clear as mud. Uh, there is no clear directive in terms of um, what you can do uh, in terms of inviting somebody. Of course, if they have a speaking role, uh, you're more than welcome to invite them and offer a ticket. Uh, the guidance that we give a lot of organizations that we work with, if they are an arts champion, if they are work involved in, in a file um, that they're engaged on and they're seen as a community champion, uh, if they're in a neighboring writing, Example, and you have a production that draws people, you may have people that are on the production from that person's writing, uh, there is a little bit of latitude to extend that out to allow those, you know, you're not stuck within the geographic boundary of the federal writing to invite somebody if there is a champion from another writing and you can justify that there are a fair number of audience members, there are a fair number of performers that come from that writing, your reach is more regional than it is strictly within the writing, there is usually a tendency to allow a little bit more latitude on the, uh, the extension of invitations to members of parliament. Thank you. And just being cognizant of the time, um, that was the time that we had for our last question. So now I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to answer the questions. And oh, so I'm I think we, or we have time for one more question, I was told. So I'll ask you one more quickly before I, move, I pass it off to Sarah Eiley. So the final question is, does the government understand that we can have larger audiences? We are still in a desperate situation. Oh, sorry, does the government understand that until we can have larger audiences, we are still in a desperate situation? Wage and rent subsidies are needed at least until summer 2022. I, I would say, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll let uh, my, my team here in the Ottawa office handle the first, and I'll come back with some additional thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think the first comment to make is uh, things are still tough for a lot of organizations, and so uh, I know that we at Global can certainly empathize with that. I was just doing a recording session myself the other day, and goodness knows I'd, I'd love to be able to go and sing in front of a large audience. And I know the organization for whom I work would love to do that as well. So I think at the first stage, we certainly want to show that empathy. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the government of Canada certainly uh, is interested in continuing the conversation about what the recovery for the arts and culture sector looks like. Uh, one of the bullet points earlier that was mentioned was the Arts and Culture Recovery Summit that the Liberal Party has promised to host in its first 100 days. That's again before the end of this calendar year, we expect. That summit would be the ideal time, and I, I can almost guarantee, I, I'm predicting the future, that this topic will come up as part of that conversation to understand that for many organizations, the capacity restrictions that are still in place, the planning schedules that still are delayed, and all the other concerns that may still be there, let alone you know, the folks that work within your industry and you know, still being in it or, or perhaps going off to another industry, all of those barriers are still in place. So the government of Canada you know, wants to do what it can to support that, I think, and, and certainly it's demonstrated that it's going to be part of that conversation through the summit. Uh, that said, I'd also mention the sector-specific funding that we've referred to a couple of times in our conversation today. We had that chart uh, on the slide a little while ago, which talked about specific funding for books, for music, for theater, whatever it may be. 
And so we expect some of that funding has already been promised, is ready to go uh, in terms of the budget 2021 process. And there is more to come. There are commitments that the Liberal Party has made to come in this new session of Parliament. All of that said, I, I certainly hear the question uh, in terms of the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy. So I, I'd say to you, make sure your member of Parliament knows. We can help you make sure that they know. Uh, but as Tara suggested off the top, writing a congratulatory letter and, and saying, hey, you know, I want you to make sure we're really happy you're here. We're really happy you've been elected. But this is still really important for your constituents. These are the sorts of things that advocacy is all about. And so uh, as a collective, as everybody on this on this call today uh, can contribute to that process, I, I think that would be the bottom line is we want to make sure the government continues to learn about the struggle that your organization faces, because I'm sure you're not the only one across the country. Anything you want to add, folks? If the, uh, if the pandemic did anything good for us, it means that it put arts and culture more on the radar in government. It was an issue that was talked about the number of times that I would see arts and culture in government transcripts. Uh, it's, it's unprecedented. So it was really amazing to see arts and culture on the radar. So it means that there's more familiarity, but we still have a job to do in the sector to let MPs and decision makers know about those nuances. They may think that they're giving us really great support um, and programs that are going to work for us, but if we don't capture some of the nuances of your situation in the design, um, we don't want you to not be able to access those supports when they become available. So it's that is really important for advocacy to make making sure that a program is designed so you can access it. In addition, I want to stress how important also connecting with your regional, your provincial and municipal representatives are as well, because that plays into some of the capacity restrictions and public health restrictions. And you want to make sure that those two respond to the realities of your organization. And I think just to wrap up the final point on that, uh, Minister Gibo, uh, and, and speaking on behalf of the entire government, has been very clear that Pandemic supports will be available for the arts and culture sector for as long as they need it. To Tara's point, it's that having them have the understanding of how long that is going to be needed and how much is going to be needed. I think the uh, the, the art uh, the, the ticket subsidy program that they have put forward is a recognition, the fact that they've extended the wage subsidy for the hardest hit sectors uh, to that maximum 75% threshold is another acknowledgement. I mean, six months ago, we had a government that was saying, listen, we can't do sector specific wage subsidies yet in the campaign document in the platform, they did it. And they included the arts and culture sector as one of the hardest hit sectors who can access that. There is no shortage of ways that this government is willing to adapt the programs if they see the need and they see the benefit on the outside. And the only way they see that is if you are outreaching to them to let them know the issues. Thank you so much to all of you at Global Public Affairs for taking the time to chat with us today and fill us in about everything. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Sarah Eiley. Thanks very much, Monica. Uh, and thank you to everybody uh, for uh, everything that you have provided today from GPA uh, it's really been incredible to see the, uh, the array of things that have been covered. Just a few things I wanted to illuminate for everybody, just remember that and underline uh, the notion of coalitions and obviously on behalf of the Canadian Arts Coalition, we work very closely with many, many people that are, uh, have been part of this call. We work very closely with GPA and we work with Business for the Arts. And it's really important to work together. And we really appreciated uh, working with the Coalition of the Hardest Hit, which helped uh, to do exactly as Sean said, make sure that uh, the government did do sector specific responses in their platform. Um, today, there are lots of things to take away. I think there's going to be lots of work still for the arts and culture sector to do. And I want to thank GPA for providing such tremendous support to us as we do it. We will be, uh, I guess, pretty busy with the new parliament, with all of the new legislative uh, uh, work that is already on their agenda. And so we'll be wanting to work together on that. And also to comment on the fact that we can all do our own advocacy now, but we, as the Canadian Arts Coalition, 
working business for the arts and working with our members across the country have worked with GPA in putting on Arts Day on the Hill for 15 years uh, on and off, depending on election years. And we look forward to doing that again when the time is right. I might also mention that um, in terms of events that uh, people can go to in the next little while, um, Culture Days is on until October 24th, both in person and digitally. And that's a great way to involve people. Uh, the new MPs in particular invite them to some Culture Days events. And so really it uh, remains to thank um, not only Global Public Affairs for their tremendous seminar today, but also Business for the Arts for their wonderful hosting of this entire speaker series, which has really been so illuminating throughout the entire year. And uh, it wouldn't be possible without presenting partner Power Corporation of Canada and also the supporting partner Manulife Financial. Thank you to both Power Corp and to Manulife for supporting this series. Thank you all for joining us today and please continue to follow Business for the Arts and the Canadian Arts Coalition. Thanks everybody and especially GPA. Goodbye.